Okay, so I said to Alex when he kindly invited me that I'm not a deep coder. Um, I uh, want to talk about the relationships of the ideas world of poetics in a way. I've always used the word poetics, never dodged the idea that music expresses something and how that is mapped across into the technology and the electronics. <coughs> So this time, unlike five years ago, I will go into some of the ideas as to how I did that in Max Patches. By your standards, the Max Patches will be relatively simple, but my talk is really about the relationship of how ideas map into technology, my take on it. And uh, the most important thing for me to stress is that actually I started in a world where there wasn't much technology. Essentially, I'm an analog being. We're all analog beings. But uh, it is horrifyingly, exactly and precisely 50 years since I went to university. I was studying music in the summer of 1968 in Germany, in my gap year between school and university. I, strictly speaking, had never studied music before. I'm an autodidact. I um, did sciences for two years at university. So the technology side sort of fitted in naturally. While I was at Cambridge, I bought one of those, actually strictly as I finished, the VCS-3, that's the suitcase version, the AKS. Suitcase version came out in 72. The VCS-3 came out the year I arrived, about 1968, 69, and a group of musicians in Cambridge got them, they got a grant to set up a live electronics group, intermodulation. I'll talk some other time about that lot, but I am essentially an analog being, roadie, Lifting loudspeakers, I know all about that. So I helped them to and set things up and learn the hard way about how tape works, how synthesizers work. And in a sense, though, seeing that is the world I still inhabit. And that has been updated. Not surprisingly, you see there a physical object that resembles a matrix in Max MSP. That, of course, is fundamental. Peter Zinoviev understood very rapidly how best to connect things together. He didn't like the maze of leads thing, uh, idea, and everything went through the patch field there. At the bottom there, by the way, is a 32, 32 memory. I didn't say 32K. I said 32 <laughs> memory voltage control. How so much were they selling at that time? These I have the receipt. I, in fact, gave a talk on this a few years ago. It was my entire savings, though it wasn't. 420 pounds I paid. Mm -hmm which was 25% of my entire annual salary that year. <laughs> I started teaching in a secondary school in Stevenage in 1972, and that cost 420 quid, and I was paid 1,600. I hired it out immediately, and I'm not stupid. So I, uh, and I got chunk of most, most of the money back within a year or so. So that's my studio in 1973. Uh, three, uh, they were not, uh, they were a British tape recorder, Ferrograph. They were very, very good. Uh, you could line them up properly, they were uh, properly controllable, but they did, in the end, give way to, I got Revoxes a couple of years later, but I had three Ferrographs, which used to belong to the group Intermodulation. I bought them off them, and uh, there's a splicing tape going on in front there, and there's an official publicity photograph, just for good measure, with me on the left. Can you help, help me? Mm -hmm. Um, and the symbols of the era, stopwatch and all. So that's the world I come from. The world, of course, that uh, we began to move into rapidly, I think reflects two things that I've written endlessly about, perhaps too much. The idea of human-machine uh, relationship there, to what extent we've got the first kind of paradigm where machines are expanding me as a human being and prosthetic idea, really. There's the prosthetic view of the machine and human, and there's the clone idea of the machine and human. And I definitely and can clearly work in that view. I have not yet, as we see the beginning of intelligent separate systems, I haven't yet moved into that view. Nonetheless, that's the kind of thing I guess some of you are now into. Okay, so... Oh, I did a lot of improvisation in the uh, 70s too, including with uh, Lowell Coxhill, who's a wonderful, fantastic uh, improviser. And I'll talk a little bit about the system that I used with uh, him in a second when I look at those worlds. I just realized that if I look at you, I can't see the screen, so I'll switch that. 
So one of my sub-themes is what happens when analog becomes digital and how we map across is that over the years, uh, I've become aware that the works of the people I studied with are no longer performable. Uh, they're quite literally, not just simply because of Theseus 3 is difficult to get, you can get one, but because all the other equipment that's around it just isn't available, the scores don't map properly. So what do you do, and I'm very keen on trying, when you work to replace something? So I'm going to take a sort of paradigmatic example, is actually a couple of pieces I did in the 70s, but I'll start with what I did in 1976, just over 40 years ago. Uh, there's a tape delay, FIFO buffer, you can run one up in 10 seconds flat in max, of course you can, dead easy. Yes, it used to take me half an hour and you had to line up the tape machines very accurately. Distance over speed equals time. You could have a nice stereo ping pong effect, seven and a half inches a second, 15 inches a second, whatever it is. You could create your uh, echo systems. I was bored stiff with that, so one day in the studio I invented an accelerating tape delay in which the right hand machine runs plus a quarter of a tone faster. Revox had a very speed controller on the top, some of plug in, turn it up. Uh, of course, you break the tape or stretch it or something if you didn't have a pool of tape that ran out across uh, the middle of the floor and ate away as, um, <clears throat> as the piece progressed. Why I put that slide in, I've forgotten. And the piece th is theoretically completely determinate. So I worked out a system where there were 64 seconds of tape across the floor and it was ate away and it takes exactly... <laughs> analog exactly means plus or minus 20 seconds, uh, 12 minutes and 3 seconds. So you've got huge errors on the system, especially if there's friction on the floor or anything. Um, so it accelerated the delay from 64 to 4 seconds. I'm splicing together bits of an analog recording that was made at the time. Here is the loop of tape up to the machines. Yeah, the piece is running in the soundtrack, but here's me switching it on. It's not synced. The audio and video are not synced. There are the two machines, good high-end reboxes by the 1980s. Every time the sound comes back, it's transposed up a quarter of a tone and is slightly shorter. And it goes on and on, transposing upwards. Here is the tape loop slowly being pulled in. <laughs> That's the buffer getting shorter and shorter. And I'm splicing together bits of the recording now. We're half or two thirds of the way through the piece. Oh, this is towards the end of the piece. I have to go out, liberate the tape from around the spool. And uh, here's the very end in out. And the tape's coming up to talk. Sorry, the mo colour modulation's a bit dark. Here is the tape reaching tension. What will happen? <laughs> Cut. Oh, I thought you would kill yeah. it. Yeah. It was meant to be synchronised with the lights going out. Okay. Uh, which it never, however, never was. Okay, so um, <laughs> in 2000 and uh, the 25th anniversary of Sonic Arts Network 4, Stockhausen came across to open Sark in Belfast and there was a Sonic Arts concert for 25 years and whoever was organising it, Phil Hallett, said, we'd like your piece back and they wanted to do the original and I just couldn't face up to the fact that I might have to get old reboxes out of the cupboard which are totally unreliable. So I said no to the old analogue, but there's a sting in this tale. Uh, actually, you see this is the Max patch. Uh, of course, it's relatively simple in Max to set up a buffer which you read faster than you feed, but it must be 64 seconds to start with, and that buffer will, you know, effectively reach singularity at the um, 12 minutes and 3 seconds in. So I have to do all the mathematics highly accurately, the, the curves of the changing delay times and all the rest of it, but in fact, you've got basically... I can just set it going. This is a real patch, isn't it? You just see the sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds uh, patch on. And immediately the delay time now is telling you. Oh, it's recording. Uh, 
exactly what the delay time is. So it starts at 64, and it immediately starts decaying downwards until it will finish at 4, 12 minutes, and 3 seconds later. So um, that's me telling you how to rehearse rather than like it's a rather 2004 patch, but there you go. It basically gives the score indication of the performer, the delay time now for me at the mixing desk, and the rest should basically work. What did we do? I was persuaded to put two tape recorders there with a loop of tape across, and uh, it was fake. So the analog world was fake. We mapped it into, into Max MSP, and 25% uh, of the audience thought I was running an authentic performance. So I, being a well-brought-up, terribly guilt-ridden lad, I said, never again. I shall never do this again. I have convinced 25% of the audience of an untruth. <laughs> so uh, I banned that. But I, instead, in fact, I have the complete video of 12 minutes and 3 seconds, which we edited together in the performance area at City University just before I left. And what I allow is that to be projected as a memory <coughs> of the analog past, so you can see it happening. In, and in fact, there's an, a video of Carla Reese playing it in front of the projection of uh, the, the flute player is not seen in the video. So this layers of recorded history are projected behind and through this particular version. That's what I propose to do in future. I'm not ever going to start fooling around trying to... Somebody else can. Authentic Analog is back any minute. You know that it's coming and people will be paid vast sums of money to dust down analog gear to do. Okay, so there we have an example of analog to digital mapping. The ideas behind the piece, because this is what this lecture is about. You can run up the max patch like that quite easily. What is actually happening and what did I do in the compositional act? The idea is of rising tension. Clearly, <laughs> you want something catastrophic to happen at the end. But this was, after all, the bicentennial of the United States of America. That's why it was written. It is Spirit of 76. I uh, don't know if in this slideshow I've got it. But anyway, you might remember it was a famous patriotic um, flag waving against getting the horrible Brits out of North America in 1776 to 1783. And that was the original picture by Willard Wright, I think his name was, uh, in 1876. And then uh, Richard Nixon's Air Force One in the early 1970s was known as Spirit of 76, which you might have seen in uh, John Adams's opera, Nixon in China, because it features on stage in that opera, Spirit of 76. It is an enormous metaphor of the idea of rising energy, something starting relatively simple. Actually, it's very sparse, the opening of the piece. I didn't play the very opening. Builds up very slowly and becomes this incredibly intense and energetic thing that is a reflection of my view of, of 200 years of energy, which is the United States of America, in whichever way you ch choose to, to see it. So, I played you the movie, and those are just the stills from it. It's, uh, there's just a glimpse of the score from 1976, just as an example. I should, there's the analog circuit. This is my typewriter of 1976 and uh, my own uh, rotaring pens and how to play the thing, and there's the score. It was influenced by the music uh, and of Yanis Zernakis because it's statistical. I was very lucky while a PhD student that Zernakis was visiting professor at City University in 1975-76. So he gave his lectures. I read formal music from end to end. And it is about, in a sense, statistical masses and how those statistical masses can build in various ways. It's planned harmonically more than Xenakis would do. And in fact, the ideas of the work are that it builds up and that it chases its own shadow. So the, the real flute player is playing higher and higher on her instrument until at the very end you get this completely insane situation where... Uh, blocks of sound are created 
because the delay time is exactly the same time as she is playing in. So you, you, you get a kind of block formation which screamingly finishes the piece. Anyway, there is one idea of analog to digital uh, move, transformation. And I just thought I'd share that with you from 1976. Other ideas that I wanted to map immediately into technology. I've never done anything else, by the way, than music made with technology. I arrived at Cambridge studying physics and chemistry, but I switched actually to do education and music, and I did music and physics in the education department uh, for two years as well. So I went to teach in schools as well as later in universities. So 78, 79, I'm held with that, is 40 years old. That sound link is missing, but I won't worry now. <coughs> I did a piece for Sing Circle. I was their director for Stockhausen Stimmung. Gregory Rose had set up Sing Circle to learn the first non-German performance of Stimmung, and I was the sound director. And the height of which, which I've got to write up, was experienced doing the proms in the Albert Hall, wiring up the Albert Hall with ring of speakers and a ring of speakers in the roof as well to resonate the roof cavity with the harmonics of the singers. Gregory asked me for a piece, and I designed a four-channel echo system in which there are actually six singers, but the singer representing Ophelia is trapped by four microphones at uh, head level. She is trapped by this system, and she can rotate round it but can't escape from it. I had seen John Cage and uh, uh, in the Albert Hall do Mesostics re Merce Cunningham uh, with uh, David Tudor, Cage and Tudor concert, 1972, and Cage had four microphones in front of him, and I've never been so shattered in my life. I've written this experience recently in the new book chapter about early listening, uh, in which faders went up, and he moved his mouth across the four microphones, and his voice just went wham around the Albert Hall, and it was just extraordinary sound, incredible sound, and I, as Stravinsky said, all oh, Compose a steel. Uh, so I stole the idea and built it into this idea of a, of a trap of microphones which you couldn't escape from. This was a dead straight line. This is a circle. So that you are projected outside the audience which surrounds her ideally. It's very difficult actually to have her bang in the middle. But the idea therefore is that you're inside and outside her head at the same time. Uh, in fact, I then ran some analog control systems such that from one microphone, you had just a single echo. From the next one round, you had two echoes. From the next one round, three. And from the fourth one, four, with a rogue fourth fader that moved you to infinity. Because, of course, you go four to one, you're then connected round again. So it was uh, one, two, three, four infinite fading, probably. All run through various kinds, well, tape systems, actually, I used an old new TAC tape recorder rather than carry two reboxes around to create a four-channel surround sound system. I'll develop the idea of space and spatialization in the realm of ideas. But that was clearly one in which, a piece in which I wanted to articulate something about mental space mapped to physical space. You were then inside and outside at the same time. And I knew I was looking at that time at uh, Gaston Bachelard and his uh, chapter of his work, one of his works is called Dedans de Or, Inside Outside, which Bernard Parmigiani used in one of his big acousmatic works, the idea of inside and outside spaces. Bachelard is a post-Freudian philosopher who looks at concepts of space uh, in his book on space that was. I was reading all about that at this time. Space as a social and psychological and physical relationship which you articulate through a loudspeaker or other kind of mediatized system. She's trapped by the technology. We're inside her head, and the music must somehow go on. Uh, there, for your interest, is the opening of this score. Uh, I still handwrite, for reasons I'll talk about, actually, later on, uh, showing where she must be with respect to each and every microphone and where exactly the settings are for six singers overall, the settings of all the electronics are notated there. I even risked 
increasing echo systems where things got louder, providing you don't have the fourth fader up that goes to infinity, which is, of course, would be mega feedback in the, in the loop. You can do increased loudness even in analog, but you're taking a risk. Okay, next theme. In the 80s, I started using samplers. And my next sort of underlying theme is how I, not we, I, no royal we's today, I hope, um, relate harmony and harmonics. I had been brought up in an age where Stockhauser Stimmung, which I just said I was sound director of for some years for Sing Circle, Stockhausen had stunned the avant-garde world by using a dominant ninth chord, so called. Of course, it's not a dominant ninth chord at all. That's just what the tonal ear calls it, with A flat upon B and C and so on. It's a B flat chord, yes, you can say that, but of course it's based on the idea of harmonics, which Stockhausen had always been interested in. Nonetheless, the key thing that he reintroduced, and my teachers at Cambridge, Roger Smalley, not related to Dennis Smalley, Roger Smalley and Tim Suster, really understood and took on board, and we all were interested in. It's a kind of rehabilitation for consonants, I would call it, not tonality, consonants. And I was fascinated because I had, in that avant-garde era, adopted total chromatic saturation, that is 12-note thinking. In other words, 12-note thinking is total chromatic saturation. Zanakis has it. He's not a 12-note composer, no, but he has total chromatic saturation, which all pitches are equal. So I was interested in that, but at the same time, I have absolutely no time for set theory and Alan Ford's work at all, because, as I did to PA last week, I remember now, it's ridiculous to think that all E-flats are equal. All E-flats are not equal at all. And uh, all pitch is absolute, is my uh, motto. I'd always been interested in how those kind of things worked. In fact, the piece of Helia's Dream, I extracted pitches that were near offers from uh, roots and harmonic series values. And out of the blue, I started developing this a lot. It makes some of my music sound perhaps too consonant, but nevertheless, I began to think about how the ideas of harmony, the idea of harmonic thinking, could be related to a rather more sort of scientific approach of looking at the real partial structures of sounds. That distinction will come up in a minute. In the 70s, yeah, everything was well-tempered and could be played on a piano, but we don't have to stick to that, do we? Uh, I found in my sketchbook in the early 80s, the first time I'd written what's called an overtone row. That is, you start on a, some kind of tonic and you just march up the harmonic series, ticking off each new pitch class as it comes, each new pitch class as it comes. So that E can't be down there, it is there, because it's a particular uh, partial or harmonic of the low B flat, and that is all 12 notes. So the idea of an overtone row, which is of course a neologism for tone row and overtone, I don't use the term overtone, I usually use the word harmonic, it gets confusing. German usage, you've got to be very careful. One of Gregory Rose's famous uh, conversations at Stockhaus I was present at was to tell him that the score of Stimmung was wrong in one or two points, uh, which I was still worried when I heard this conversation start because he, you know, in German you count Oberturner, which means that you, your first overtone is in fact your second harmonic. So you can get actually very confused if you do the calculations too quickly. You've got to be careful. I always say, use harmonic. And anyway, don't ever forget, harmonics are only theoretical constructions. We actually hear partial tones enough some other time. Um, the overtone row idea I started developing and playing around with, and I'm still now moving into an era only 10 years after my students where I want the machine to help me do that. I was doing this with my own lovely sketched handwriting. So anyway, this began to develop and I started working out how these things could be combined. Now, the interesting thing is, by the 80s, we had at City University where I was a Fairlight sampler, Fairlight CMI, computer music instrument, Australian. It, this is my water, good. Um, the Fairlight, <clears throat> oh, 
use this phrase too often, but here it is again. Eight times one second of sound, one second of sound cards, yours for only 10,000 quid. That was the starting price. If you wanted an extra to it, it became 15,000 quid. Uh, it didn't compete when Yamaha brought the S900 out for 1,000 quid or less. It, uh, Yamaha blew the Fairlight out of the water in the mid-late 80s. But the Fairlight had an immensely strong and powerful thing called, rather unadventurously, MCL, Music Composition Language. And the Music Composition Language really allowed microcontrol of envelope and uh, various other parameters and timing, fantastically tight timing control. And myself and the wonderful Latin American students that were at City at the time did not know that we had invented granular sampling. Because each independently, we said, how am I going to, look, I've got this piano sound. How am I going to extend it? And so we put simple envelopes on it, and you programmed MCL to run through the eight voices and then start again. And then we created drift. that You could actually then get it to retune slightly and move the sound around. And we then worked in the unlock domain with an eight-track, one-inch tape recorder, a very high-quality Dolby system. So we montaged an analog that generated through the, um, uh, through the Fairlight. And uh, the point here is that I could retune the sustains which lift out of the live piano to true values of the harmonic series. Yeah, I know the piano is actually a very inharmonic instrument, and actually that there's no such thing as true value of the harmonic series. But anyway, I did. You could have an A-flat, and it would drift to the nearest value of a harmonic series. So that is what is happening in the entire tape part. It was constructed in the studio, in which the nature-nurture relationship I call that a pretty cultural object. Uh, everything about the electronics is about drifting it back to where, in an ideal world, perhaps Lamont Young's well-tempered piano would have shifted it back in that direction. All the extensions are on tape. Totally retuned just in time to cut off. That's an interesting. Let's go back. Well, no, you, you get the idea. But that's studio work. That is done in the studio laboriously, hours and hours of work to get that done. Of course, even in that time, one is dreaming, one is of automatic systems to do that. So we were dreaming of granulated, granulars, granulars, <coughs> max MSP or whatever, at least 20 years, well, 15 anyway before they arrived. And again, that universe of sound comes to me from that era. It doesn't necessarily, it's not a generic product for me of Max MSP as such. Those are the things I was searching for, trying to do that kind of thing live. Anyway, there's the score of it too. Um, <clears throat> in 1985, I got a preview of Trevor Wishart's on Sonic Art you know, I did the edition of 1996, the, the, the um, later one that you can still get. The original of 1985, I'd included a chapter from it, rewritten by Trevor for the language of electroacoustic music in 1986, but I was talking to him in 84, 85. And throughout that period, I was fascinated with his ideas of space and landscape, and I wanted to adapt these to the electronics. Another layer of ideas now. I'm going to move into space as well as harmony. Uh, Dennis Smalley, of course, famously has related the two, the idea of spectral space. I'm a bit more of a literalist. I'm a bit more of an impressionist. I actually think in literal space as well as, as abstract harmonic space. So, again, second kind of dream was how to do what Trevor had done in studios, live. 
So a new generation of, of processors came along, and um, I grabbed them as soon as possible, including the Yamaha gear I was referring to, not just samplers. The Yamaha SPX90 was revolutionary in its consequences in 1987. It does things I still don't completely understand today. I'll talk about that kind of mapping to digital in a minute, because that's digital to digital, early digital to later digital. It can be very problematic. Um, so uh, anyway, new generation of sound modules led me to think about ideas which I know I've lectured about before. So I'm going to just summarize this area, I think. The idea of local and field relationships, which will come up with the piece you'll hear tonight. The idea of things that transform me as a performer immediately about concerning my own performance. I'm still me. And field functions, which are about the control of the space around. It's not a dialectical pair. There is a continuum between the two. I often have to stress this because I'm not making strict division. To a certain extent, I've just told you a not quite truthful remark because what the first thing I did was I got an Elysis quadroverb and an SPX90, and one of them dealt with the immediate space and the quadroverb dealt with the space around the hall. You were forced to do things like that before in Max MSP. You were forced to divide your world up but any composer is already thinking of the next generation of desire, if you like. So I always thought of local and field as two things that you can manipulate. Immediate sound transformations of the human performer, field transformations and pre-recorded stuff too, that set you in a landscape in some way. So landscape thinking, I was trying to move into live electronics, and I've written from the 90s onwards about space frames. That is, of course, uh, an ancient Greek theatre in disguise. Uh, Epidavros is laid out that way. You just have to see. In fact, I should have put that slide in. Uh, an event happens on a stage in an arena set in a landscape. And uh, that's dividing up local, in a sense, and field also. And, of course, in the ancient Greek theatres, it's in the open air. Let's, there's another version of it. There is a sense in which the ancient Greek theatre has direction. There is a forward from the what's known as the orchestra out forward to the space beyond. The point about technology, however, which I want to move into now, is that it mashes that up. Famously, I could say that is a diagram of Page's Oratorio or Music Circus or any of those pieces where technology can actually take an event and make it the size of an arena, or project to you every place in Finnegan's Wake which mentions sound, which Cage has visited and recorded in 20th century Ireland, and it was projected on a 24 channel system downwards. So Dublin was hovering above you and being projected down while you wandered slightly aimlessly amongst some Irish traditional musicians in the gallery and then him playing vast conch shells under high amplification, a wonderful piece called Inlets, which gurgling conch shells with mics on and promise you is a stunning sound. Clearly, every one of those variations four, if you don't know the recording of that, is about pulling those things apart and gluing them together in a rather different way at different um, sizes, in a sense. It's about size. And you can also reorg reorder them in a very different order. Of course, you can then add to landscape, geoscape, and even uh, spacescape. Of course, once you start locking into the internet resources, you can extend that beyond the sound horizon. The sound horizon is only a physical limit. Of course, we now have no sound horizon effectively after mediation. This, too, I've written about a lot, but those are the kinds of things that I think uh, I find useful to map onto my live electronics. Uh, the idea, this is a relatively simplistic group of concepts. They're rather extra musical in some ways. I'm talking rather extra musically here. Many of you will probably deal with things inside the musical world. But that, to me, is a useful set of thinking about how you can express something outside of the music which you have to translate into the musical forms. And I'm just going to give you an example of early digital where I did this, 
90 to 91, this piece I have mapped um, uh, to, to Max MSP as well, but this recording actually was made in the late 1980s. Here is my mashup of uh, Shakespeare's Full Fathom Five, Thy Father Lies. Uh, I've deliberately restructured it such that there are palindromes and things that run backwards and stuff. I then took the quadroverb and the SBX90, and now a match patch, and I said, how can I do similar transformational things within this patch? What is it? Because clearly Full Fathom Five, uh, his bones are transferred into coral, his eyes become pearls. It's a metaphor of transformation of substance. And I want to map this into musical terms. How do you do that? Well, let's just do it. <laughs> um, listen to it. So, that I have done into Max MSP. And that was a very different experience because early digital to late digital only, the early digital doesn't reveal anything to you about their patch. So you have no information as to how the Yamaha did any of that work. You or all the Alesis. So the Alesis patch you heard was the one opening, which takes her and, and, and there's a very LFO. I stripped all presets down, as one should, and then uh, put a, an LFO on the sustains so that one is going plus and one is going minus and comes back together again. That I have actually cloned in the piece you'll hear tonight, 20 years later, uses a similar max patch to do exactly the same thing. I call it the Ligeti transformation because it becomes a, a, a vast cluster and then back to a singularity. But that comes from an Alesis quadriverb world where they'll tell you roughly what's going on in each of the patches, but, they, but we will never know what their proprietary prom programs were because they were all burnt into the infrastructure of the piece. Remember, it wasn't ever, you'd never load anything. It was all built into these devices. Yamaha's octave division, which I loved, uh, well, transposer, I guess it was a time domain transposer because they can't have had FFT fast enough in 89 of the devices. So it must have been time domain, but no one could imitate the quality of that thing. And I just haven't a clue. So in rewriting its max patch a couple of few years ago, it was done again. Uh, I just had to use AB comparison. You have to guess what's going on, and then just AB, 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 you compress, just this, just this, no, try it again, try it again. So I used the old quadroverb, max patch on the right, quadroverb on the left, same source, pre-recorded, untreated voice, AB, AB, until you get roughly what you think is right. But uh, it's really quite difficult, and no one until an archaeologist has excavated a, a, an SBX90 will actually know what went on inside them. So early to late digital transformation is non-trivial and very difficult to do, but very good for the ears. <laughs> um, patterns. Uh, by 2003, yes, using, I personally was using Max quite a lot, interested in space, and the idea of how space is articulated. And I was asked to do a piece for Philip Mead and a Brass Ensemble for the Royal Northern. And I was asked to use advanced techniques, noise, um, vowels through the instruments so that the student quintet would learn. They were brilliant performers, absolutely fantastic. I was so lucky, conducted, even though quintet was bound to be a conductor for coordination purposes that needed that. And, um, I decided to do a kind of mirror formation. Uh, I invented the term uh, 10 years ago, acousmatic, acousmatic music. <laughs> because to me, a loudspeaker is a real object. So if acousmatic music comes out of loudspeakers that you can see, acousmatic, acousmatic music comes out of loudspeakers you can't see. I'll give another example of this later on. So I decided to put all the speakers behind the audience that you can see. But anyway, behind the audience. And they're essentially in the loudspeaker zone, but strictly it starts <coughs> and works backwards. The idea being that the live instruments are always paired on the diagonal in some way. So you've always got a mirror. Actually, 
I realized only very recently that that relates to my very earliest experiences of live electronic music, which was a piece by Roger Smalley, where he had paired uh, instruments on the diagonal for the London Symphonietta in 1969. And only when I actually investigated the piece later did I realize that deep in my conscience must have been this idea of diagonal change across the space. But anyway, the um, essentially the Yes, there were all the usual things, amplified resonances, spatialized echoes. Now this I wanted to investigate, and I've spent quite a lot of time on. I cascaded the echo systems such that they would never ever repeat. And I'm not quite happy ten years later that I succeeded in making sure that no patterns were recognizable because in fact it doesn't just pair on the diagonal, there are bounce patterns around the room as well as pairs on the diagonal. So nonetheless, I want to just play you an example of what I mean by this kind of articulation of space. My, I forgot to say that uh, you remember what that diagram was. A very early sketch, which I immediately erased, was to treat the piano like a bull in a bull ring and the idea of all the instruments facing in towards the piano. But I thought that was a horrible image, so I dropped it relatively quickly. Nonetheless, the term arena has persisted, and of course, aren, or arenas in, in Latin countries, is where such things take place. But the piano is not a taunted animal. Uh, the piano fights back and wins most of the time. Anyway. So you get the idea. I'm trying to articulate a space within which patterns are not <coughs> predictable but which somehow enveloped the audience with this drama. It's a dramatic attempt at a dramatic use of the space in question. So, I never... Sorry, is it the, the piano and brass yes. uh, is the samples? Or no. is everything is live? Live. Okay. Uh, everything might, everything okay. going to the max patch for this okay. distribution. Because somehow it seemed like the piano was... Effect, like making the delay happen, which was brass delay. Well, I'm glad you said that because it is strongly coordinated. The attacks are strongly coordinated, but in fact, it doesn't trigger them. No. Okay. It's written to uh, the attack points are written in coordinated. Yeah. Um, the piano I've remembered now is only amplified and distributed. The brass is transformed. All right, yeah, that's what I meant, that you hear the transformed brass when you uh, hear Yeah, okay. piano doesn't trick, but the piano's not transformed. All right. It doesn't do any work. Well, <laughs> it does musical work. I'm going to now talk about how I use cascaded urn objects to create a memory structure. Uh, and also, I'm wanting to discuss space. So this is a piece I did the same year as the violin piece, which I'll finish with a, a detailed look at in a moment. But I just want to mention a work I did for Berlin in 2010. PA's been there. I was there in 10, uh, 9, 10 as the Gast Professor. And um, it's called Memory Machine. And the idea is that I'm interested in space not simply as geometry, but as not as a thing out there, but as a perceptible, conscious, as I say, almost living thing that surrounds us. We are creating the space around us. Memory itself is spatial, of course. We spatialize memory very famously. Whoops, sorry. Uh, I've been fascinated by Francis Yates' book, The Art of Memory, from the 1960s for a long time. Uh, how did Roman senators and Greek uh, teachers memorize uh, the Odyssey or whatever? And the answer is they did. And one of the possible uh, methods is the creation of a memory theater. It's based on the number five. This is 2,000 years ago, and is that famous article, five plus or minus two, is what we remember extremely quickly um, and easily. Anything from three to seven objects is easily memorable. And uh, this was an entire theory of memorization, where you would imagine a room with five doors in it, and you would uh, place the memories of what you had to speak about in the Senate this afternoon at each of those doors. Well, that's all right so far, but you're much more sophisticated and you've been trained since you're so high. So you walk through that door and there are another five doors. 
So it's a tree system of memory. So you go through all, by the way, it's pillars. You can also have a pillar associated with a memory and you attach something to it. And you memorize through there five pillars and so on. And then you walk through it in your mind and the memories are triggered back to you. So this memory space idea is uh, based on the idea of locus, position, images are forms, this is her words, marks or simulacra of what we wish to remember. Loci relate to each other such they can be walked through in the imagination. So what better way to structure a memory theatre piece of music? Uh, you recall the image through walking through it. And why do I, uh, Giordano Bruno, uh, burnt at the stake for heresy, Robert Flood, luckily in this country somehow, survived, and there is his memory theatre of 1619, and yes, Shakespeare's Globe, uh, and especially the Rose Theatre in London, is believed, uh, well, perhaps actors, heavens above, you've got to learn the script in a short time, perhaps some of the key actors of the day learnt it by, you know, to be or not to be is over there and you've learnt it that way. We are not quite sure of that, it's not explicit, but some of the designs of, it, of Elizabethan theatres were undoubtedly influenced by floods and others. Uh, this came from Italy and elsewhere uh, to England in that century. Flood wrote a lot about it, the memory theatre, 1619. Teatrum Orbi, the theatre of the world, is written there in the middle. So I based a piece around it. It's a concert installation. And uh, I think actually what I'm going to do is see if the Max Batch just runs, actually. I think it just should do. The idea of the urns is simple. Uh, I wanted a piece that lasted a certain amount of time, but then ran again differently, then ran again differently, then ran again differently. So the idea is that, in fact, it's a 12-minute piece, but it's actually mixed live. So let's just Oops, two channel, I want a two channel version for now. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. I didn't know that sound was going to happen. So, what I did was I assembled some sound files, lots and lots and lots of sound files, of environments that I've recorded myself over 35 years or more, 40 years. I recorded a harp that somebody had left in a field uh, with the wind blowing through it, a real Aeolian harp. A story to tell about that recording in a minute. I was in Croatia, so I recorded the fantastic seashore. Croatia is where Shakespeare's Tempest took place around that coast, and so on. So I've recorded these environments around the place. And here's a beehive. I put the thing over my head, put two extremely expensive Neumann microphones at the bottom of the beehive, and fed them to the first generation of digital tape recorder, an F1 based on a video system the size of a small um, car, uh, pointed out to the beehive with a long lead of the Brown batteries, on the lead of the Brown batteries, 1982, and recorded this beehive, and so on. Now, this is all being mixed live. I don't know now, as I speak to you, what is going to happen next, because my memories are being worked through in a certain order through cascades of urns. The first urn decides if it's going to be an environmental memory or I don't know if we can wait long enough, but anyway, there's some musical memories too, in which I've taken samples of, I'm being recorded, but I'm going to admit on this recording that they've plundered off my collection um, of well-known contemporary composers uh, from the modernist era, because I used to teach modernism previously. Uh, that's the harp in the field that's just come in. Anyway. Uh, so from late Beethoven, through Schoenberg and Webern, Varese, to Stockhausen, and I sampled various of these tiny things. You cannot hear any melodic information. Uh, you get basically frozen timbral aspects, drift in and out of these environments as one's memories move forward to other things. And then there are random inserts from my memories of the rock music I used to enjoy 50 years ago exactly. It happens to be Jimi Hendrix playing feedback guitar. The Star Spangled Banner is one, I'll reveal that to you. And various other things, they're just frozen and they appear. Sometimes the Hendrix actually wipes out everything that's there and comes forward. And that's also spatialized in various ways. So, it's such a shame. I'm going to let it run till some music 
memories come up and then I'll say, ah, it's not meant to be a name that tune. But uh, people have gone, yeah, I heard the Marla 10, I did. And now this is one of the inserts which come in and then start wiping memories out. It's Gruppen. The insert of Gruppen, the fantastic brass chops that, that stopped the flow of Stockhausen's Gruppen about two thirds of the way through. And um, anyway, we'll let it run on and I will see what memories come out. Irina's just gone, but I'll now talk about Stringscape after that, which she will be performing Is tonight. Is it possible to see this uh, urn uh, patch? Oh, uh, urn patch, right. Oh. Uh, it, they're everywhere. Just a sec. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, strangely, uh, that's crossover. Oh, I haven't talked about, I use convolution a lot to create what I call strange space. Uh, that's actually a convolution patch happening there, mm -hmm. in which I take two files that are unrelated, convolve them, and then that spectrum is in the spatial image between the originals, which creates a very weird spatial spectral effects. So, you know, sound file A is convolved with sound file B, and the convolution is, is actually diagonal, I think, across between them. So you get, as I say, uh, spatialized. Here's Beethoven's ninth third movement, the extraordinary chord, which is A major with a B flat at the top. And uh, Adorno says this is the beginning of modernism, 1820 something. Anyway, here it is. Uh, I'm actually running three or four versions of it phasing, micro time phasing, just very tiny amounts so that there is uh, spatial phasing between the loudspeakers. I'll look out the urns. It sounds like Ligeti, but it's not. It's Wagner multiplied. I call it going down the Danube. Some urns. The urns are all in fives, but they're, they're sort of distributed everywhere. They're choosing which route it's going. That's choice layer order, which is it's difficult to explain, but the order in which these things are occurring are all being chosen there. Except that's multiplied by about eight on different slides and on different uh, sub matches. That's there's the harp in the field combined with Schoenberg's. Um, I breathe the air of other planets.
and there's some Marla coming in. Anyway, you get the idea. Yeah, I'm very grateful for the questions, by the way, because I've kind of forgotten where these things happen within the system. But essentially, each of these processes will occur, which is why I love early, but I just don't know what order they're occurring. That's really the point. So the big layers are environment music, that's earned. Then within each of those, you've then got another set of urns deciding which files will be remixed in the memory next. This ran for one hour in the first performance, five times, and each of the five times is a completely different order of the memories. That's the Marla. And so on. By the way, there's another point about it. There is no direction, there's no forward. It's another important issue if you deal with multi-channel. There's a five-channel version of that and an eight-channel version. The two-channel is only for stereo reference. I don't want it performed in two. It's meant to be surround. Because there are five doors, you might think I did the five because of 5.1. I didn't. I did it because there were five doors in the original theory. So each of the gaps between the five loudspeakers is a door and the door opens to the memory, and that's how the spatialization of the memories work. And behind each door is some of these sound files being remixed and uh, presented. Yes, I do eight because so many systems you've come across are also eight channel, so I work it outwards a bit and, and develop it into an eight. But uh, both are built into the patch, you can just switch between the two. That's the Vellenfeld synthesizer at Teo Berlin being built. The wires are hanging down the walls. You've got, as I write there, a mere 832 discrete audio channels. Don't think of them like eight channel multiplied up. They are, in fact, uh, part of a Huygens array, if you know your optics. As delta D, the gap between the speakers, tends to zero, you will get a perfect wave front. You've got some way to go before delta D going to zero. That will be a pixelated structure. I've often dreamt of this in which you have a substance. They're working at it now, of course, they are in California and elsewhere, probably in China, in which each equivalent of a pixel on the screen will be a piston. And then you're getting delta D right down to, to the level of a pixel, and then you will get perfect wavefront. And it's the only system that can generate true Doppler. Do not ever believe GRM's Doppler shift. It's a fraud. It's only true for you, <laughs> third person. That's the only place in the room that even ambisonics isn't dealing truly with Doppler. Wave field does, because the wave itself is being shunted forward towards you and therefore is genuinely being compressed or rarefied. So anyway, that's the wave field synthesizer. And yes, when they've covered those up, I call that acousmatic acousmatic as well. I couldn't see any loudspeakers. And the first diffusion, I had a generous half day rehearsing it where you could bring some of the stems out into the room Truly, um, I don't think I've ever seen anybody apart from some of the sound installations in there actually exploit um, <clears throat> the three-dimensionality of the wave field. Um, it's a great system. Tiny digression, because it's on the slides, I think of that as hidden loudspeakers. You can think of the Klangdom systems as containers, in a sense, they too can be acousmatic acousmatics, but of course, our friends in France, it's really the loudspeaker sculpture, isn't it? That's why I have some doubts about the use of the word acousmatic. Look, they're beautiful and they're lit. All French systems are wonderfully produced, as he's making an absurd generalization. They're incredibly visual and wonderful to hear. So loudspeakers, I think, have a real physical and dramatic presence and a part of our conception of the work, in a way. I was asked to do this piece, which Alex ran the tech, tech for here in ICMC 2011. Uh, it was commissioned by Dara Morgan, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here, just for fun. I have only ever written music for real people, that is, people I know. I don't write a string quartet and then find a string quartet. I don't write a piece for soprano and then find the soprano. Somebody asks me for a piece, I work with them to their skills. This is a strongly performative view, I mentioned that in my abstract that you've seen. Uh, I do actually believe in working with performers and in taking their advice and in using their strengths. 
you can stretch their strengths, you can do crazy things. But I, he lent, Darren Morgan lent me tons of stuff, written and recorded, <coughs> and I had seen him, heard him play. He plays everything from Baroque, Baroque through to, he was at the Cage uh, Music Circus at the uh, English National Opera a few years ago, playing in that as well. He's done a five-hour Feldman DVD recently. Morton Feldman. So, huge amounts of skills, which I divided into three ideas, lyric, texture, and drone. Uh, the second half of the 20th century, a bit more than that. I've loved to find these relationships between early century and late century working. And Alban Berg and Anton Weben. Weben is not largely associated with lyric, but I deny that. If you actually look at the music carefully, it has wonderful lines and ways that those lines work together. Clearly Alban Berg as well. Much less so Arnold Schoenberg. I know how influential he is, but I find his music less appealing to me personally. I mentioned George Ligeti earlier on. Um, wonderful composer, especially those pieces that were influenced by electronics in the 1960s onwards. I've always been fascinated by his ability to handle texture in a very controlled, beautiful, physically beautiful way through to the piece Lontano, which deals with depth in a way which I know no other orchestral work does. He said of his own piece, Lontano, that it deals with time, distance in time as well as distance in space, which is a wonderful poetic way of looking at it. Uh, you hear the horns and you're back with Bruckner 150 years ago. Then there's the minimalists. I'm very interested in Lamont Young, actually, even though his work is not particularly well known. The idea of very long sounds and how they change slowly has always fascinated me in many different ways. Not so much the rhythmic minimalism of, of Glass or Reich, but the idea of sustainment and its slow change. And of course, um, my professor at City University many, many, many years ago said there is an unwritten book on how Lamont Young and the minimalist influence Stockhausen and the Europeans. It's that way round and it's not much researched. Profound influence, it may well be that Stockhausen Stimmung came out of the American experience of him going to California. Stockhausen going to California in those years. That's for somebody else to research. Um, I'm interested in the idea of mosaic. I'll explain this in just a second as to how I put this particular piece together. So I say, here's Dara. He really does these three things are the three elements I'm going to build the piece from and we'll see how that actually works. Um, uh, I've got these slides in the wrong order, damn it, but never mind, here we go. <clears throat> I should say that the electronics follows on from this analysis, but there's actually a couple of things that happens before I reach that, but I came up in the end with five kinds of processing. Uh, granular sustains, I build my own granulators, as we all do. I happen to use a particular bell shape that I like, cosine function, which has nice slope functions in it and produces a particularly smooth form of, of, of granular sustain. I think I've got eight of them at work. Was it six? I can't remember. Um, I also have a macro level granular, which is not strictly speaking defined as a granulator, but it happens to work exactly the same way, but with much longer time scales. So it can actually get snippets of notes themselves, which are then scrambled and sustained in various ways. So macro level sustain. Um, the third process there, granular sustain with slow drift to cluster, is what I call the Ligeti effect, where a single note is trapped and moved out into being a cluster uh, of, of tones. I use spatialized filtering. I didn't mention that in the memory machine as well. Uh, I not only use spatialized convolution to create strange space, but I also use four-channel, uh, many-channel, multi-channel dynamic band filters around the space so that sounds are ambiguously positioned to confuse the ears, and that's dynamic. So the sound appears to be stationary, but isn't because it's spectrally moving around you the entire time. Uh, and also a cloud sound, which is random reread of buffers in certain ways, such that a cloud in the high register is created. Um, those are mapped onto the types of music which I feel, Dara, you're getting my drift, I'm analyzing a performance skill that influences the choice of the electronic transformations. These are not independent and they're not abstract. 
they are because of the particular nexus of performance, musical type, and electronic result. So um, I map that onto those textures in that way. There are so many different kinds of texture that uh, a violinist can perform that are in fact subdivided in various ways. But that's the general spirit of it. Uh, oh, I said I'd mention why I still use my glorious handwriting after 40 years. Yes, I have got finale, and yes, I will typeset the damn thing. But this is a very important point. At least when I sketch, not so much when I write a neat score, it is true. I'm infinitely faster than I could be using my hand. I'm sitting at the piano, I compose at the piano, and I'm scribbling all the time. And I do not yet know the computer system. I know I could use a scribble pen on my iPad. I know I could. But I still find it in, it's immensely slower for me because I have been so used to it that I still use handwriting. And I'm using uh, proportional time the entire time. And we all know that whichever package you use, you have to fool Finale into working in proportional time. It just pisses me off the way that it doesn't let you just say, I want the note there, and I want it to stay there, and I don't want it to move when I put another note there. But uh, you know that that's quite difficult. I'm just about getting grip of it, and I will set all these in due course. I'm being too defensive. Right. Uh, that, then, is an example page from Strings. It doesn't matter about too much detail at the moment. You can tell lyrical lines happening, this cloud's happening. What I've done there is given you the crib sheet where L is lyric, D is drone, and T is texture. So it's a kind of mosaic form in which I'll tell you the tricks I'm going to use to develop my mosaic. I call it a mosaic form because the mosaic does develop as you walk across it, but it's formed from the gluing together of fragmentary units of different lengths. So T's and L's and then by them are the processes, which actually Irina's companion will be actively doing. This is going to be 100% live, so the actual processing is done manually. Many people have asked me in your position, why don't I use score followers? I haven't <laughs> got that yet. I haven't quite got that far yet. If I could get into score following, but actually, I think of it as a duo performance anyway, because the second person is following the first one. The violinist has complete control over tempo, time, and uh, Dara first performs at 21 minutes and is now down at 15 or 16 as you work your way into the piece. That's fine with me, that's absolutely fine. So all of these are being activated by a second performer. And that's a mosaic idea of a, of a mosaic build-up of what is going on. I do use um, the, um, <clears throat> a certain amount of following of the sound, so that in fact, I'll put, I'll put the um, Max Patch on that shit so a bit. Anyway, old fashioned type of program, I operate it with a MIDI controller, uh, so that I've got control over all the spot through faders, and uh, I think that's what we're doing tonight. So that basically speaking, not on the screen there, is a fiddle object which is following and triggering the processes. Not all of them, the granular processes are triggered. Of course, I must have launched this on a big computer before. There we go. So the size of the screen's a bit wrong. There we go. So, um... Yeah. Here are my triggers coming in, and I allow the <clears throat> second performer to override fiddle because it's unreliable. I actually have mouse manual override, there we go, of the various uh, triggers there. Essentially, these five processes are happening. Why am I doing it? Because of much bigger things that are happening within the idea of the piece, which is where I really want to finish uh, on the ideas level. If we go back now to, okay, because lying behind the mosaic is a bigger plan, and the electronics help articulate the bigger plan, the live sampling, the uh, various statistical things happening. I have built this on a large scheme, classical ideas of fifths on the strings of the violin, but of course transposed to a certain extent, with ideas of sustainment, and I think I was using one of the overtone rows and its inversion and various other ways. 
So behind the piece is a harmonic scheme. That's very important. Because the live granulation isn't there just simply to produce a slightly washy impressionistic backdrop. What it's doing is deliberately sustaining one chord under the next, such that there is a plan for where the harmony goes. It is non-arbitrary, it is not completely coloristic. So the, I believe it to be six granulars, work on the basis that it triggers one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven removes one. So it, it is a continuously circular buffer system times six, so that in fact the sustains are all six note chords, which completely just change as the piece goes, gradually adding one, subtracting one, as the piece progresses. The... Ooh, blimey, does that come out? Oh, here are some of my sketches. I just slipped these in. Ooh, ah, they're a bit light, but there you go. That's what I mean by operating very quickly. I was transcribing ideas from Dara's actual performances, the textures, the drones. I didn't reveal to you that I spent endless hours Sudoku-like doing Fibonacci uh, expansion sequences and things just to exercise the mind. Uh, I look at symmetries, the idea of organic growth patterns, the idea of ways that I can express through the use of Fibonacci numbers uh, various things going. So in fact, the 12 sections of the piece start mapping them out, 3, 5, 8, 8, 35, 3. But that's not arbitrary, that's part of a grander scheme where there are tendencies within the Fibonacci mapping towards a particular goal. So the textures move in a particular direction, the drones move in another direction, the lyrics tend to expand in a third direction. These are then laced together such that the pattern of things on the mosaic, each of the individual three things develops in a different way as the piece progresses. And these are controlled by these number systems, which I do manually, haven't helped me. And uh, I work them out in sketchbooks over a long coffee or late at night with fermented grape juice. Now, <laughs> essentially, that's an example of uh, one of these Fibonacci expansions just between friends. I don't usually reveal this to audiences, but uh, I'm beginning to break down uh, various total groups because they all total a certain number, and that number drifts across in a various way to create the tendencies. So I'm using the idea of tendency, of ways through, of evolution, with Fibonacci, which I think is a very good way of not having four square uh, temporal relationships. Um, there it is ordered. It's beginning to become more like the score, in which I can now map this forward, in which I've started saying where the lyrics, the textures, and the drones are inserted, actually. I realize now that drones are something that hold the whole piece together. So in fact, the drones are inserted in the lyric and texture structure to generate the final uh, piece. So lying behind these are ideas of form and generation, which feed back then into the electronic patch building and what is chosen to do what. And the granulars are there to sustain the harmonies underneath the succeeding harmonies. So there's a, an idea of an evolutionary harmony across uh, the entire thing there. Simon, the right column, I did the right column are the targets for the, the movement's energy? Like... Yes. Oh, well, <coughs> those are the energy tendencies. Yay. That's right. That's my scribbles. And those are the many different, well, four or five different shape types you've got across. And that's the 12 sections of the piece. That's the second one, section two. This is how you read it. And those are the different ones. I do connection schemes, too, which connect these together in certain ways. So, um, I just carry on to my pattern, and then write it out on the super score, and then it's a, feed the stuff in. It's a symmetry. Yeah. It's completely symmetrical from the top to the bottom. It is, isn't it? That's exactly right. It is completely symmetrical, and indeed that was on that one, uh, top left to bottom right. Mm -hmm. I, yes, there's symmetrical schemes happening there, absolutely. And the Fibonacci breakdown of 
the total Fibonacci number is always Fibonacci. Cloud. There's the, it's captured and now becoming a broad thing. frequency distributions. Oh, there's one of the big captures. And so on. So, in drawing to a conclusion, that's where I was in 2010. But if you're here tonight, that will be uh, where Irina will, will pick that up. I've recently been doing work with a flute player. I'll just finish with a one sentence summary, which I built uh, a, flute system, um, a flute piece for the Carla Reese's King Mark flutes, which use quarter tones, especially uh, extra keys to produce full range quarter tones, which I'm basing the ideas on the analysis of multiphonics. She's played me 107 multiphonics I chose from about 200 we recorded. I analyzed them all by hand, plotted out all the constituent parts of the multiphonics, and used those to generate the re rhetoric of the flute. And that's an eight-channel, uh, spatialized, sustained piece. But I've been trying to develop also the automation, which I was referring to earlier. 